So kids, if you like to go out to the classes, and then Sophie's going to come and read for us, starting at Matthew 27, verse 57. <coughs> Oh, hang on. Is it you? Yes. Oh, sorry. I was told so few of reading. I, I didn't know which one. Do <laughs> <laughs> carry on. You look confused, so I was confused. You said. <laughs> <Yes. Sorry. laughs> Matthew chapter 27, verse 57 to 28, verse 15. The burial of Jesus. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. The next day, the one after preparation day, <coughs> the chief priests and Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that the senior said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other men went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The gods were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who is crucified. He is not here, he is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to His disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, he will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. So, <clears throat> we're going to look at the resurrection and Dodging the resurrection is what I call it, truth of the resurrection. The day after Good Friday, I call it Bad Saturday, and when we look back, Good Friday is good, but at that time, Good Friday was not good. And Saturday was probably just as bad. And then when you come to Sunday, you see the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, downcast, lost hope, thought Jesus was dead, thought he was, all his promises had come to nothing. So those times were really, really bad. Uh, they thought that was it. They forgot Jesus said he would rise. They didn't understand. But what's amazing here is that the Jewish leaders went to Pilate, and though Jesus' own disciples had forgotten that Jesus said he'd rise on the third day, and were in deep mourning, these Jewish leaders remembered that he said he'd rise. 
His enemy remembered that he said he'd rise on the third day. And his own people did. And so they went to Pilate and they said, Sir, Matthew 27, 63, they said, We remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, After three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first, they said. Suddenly, although they remembered what Jesus said about being raised, they didn't actually believe he would be raised. They call him, in verse 63, that deceiver. They taunted Jesus at the time to come off the cross so that in their eyes he would then prove he was the Messiah. But because he did come off the cross and because he did die, they probably thought he was a saint because they had a different idea about what the Messiah was supposed to come for. Yet the very fact he didn't come off the cross proved he was the Messiah. For the Messiah was supposed to suffer and die, and these Jewish leaders, they were teaching them the Old Testament scriptures, and they kind of missed this. Isaiah the prophet, written 700 years before Jesus ever came, it says that he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, that's it. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. They should have known that the coming Messiah was supposed to suffer and die. But anyway, they didn't see the resurrection as a good thing if it happened. Dead or alive, they wanted to make sure Jesus did not get out of that too. That was their, that was their thing. They hated Jesus, always did, always well. Well, maybe not always well. So we see that the guards, in order to try and stop Jesus from rising, I guess, or in order to stop what they thought was the lie of the Hebrews, they're posted 24 7 at the entrance of the tomb. That 65, take a guard, verse 65, take a guard, Pilate answered, go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. Now, this wasn't one guard. In 28 verse 4 and verse 11 to 12, we see that it was more than one guard. Um, so posting a guard means plural. Um, it could have been temple guards that were assigned to the Jews that were on guard. It could have been the whole company that was in charge of Jesus' crucifixion, the Romans. Usually the crucified took days to die. So they were assigned, the uh, platoon or whatever of the Romans, were assigned for a few days to watch over them until they did that. But Jesus died early. So because they were assigned for a few days, they could still be called upon. Either way, they sealed that stone in place with either wax, clay, or cement, or some kind of official seal of Pilate. And I actually think Pilate was scared that Jesus might rise from the dead, because you remember his conversation in, uh, uh, at the uh, trial. Uh, Pilate was terrified of and thought he was some kind of a god. Now the stone that they dropped into the uh, uh, tomb, to cover the tomb, well, could have been up to two tons in weight. So it was heavy, and it slotted in a groove which slid downwards until the tomb was shut. And sealing it in place made it impossible to shift it. It was cemented in. Plus you've got guards posted outside. No one is getting in or out of that tomb in a human way. That was the point. They had made it burglar proof, so not even the cleverest person would ever get out of that tomb at all. But the leaders claimed the resurrection was itself a deception. 64. Gives the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day, otherwise his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people the generation of the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. For them, the first deception was that Jesus was their Messiah. They didn't agree with that. They didn't believe that. Second deception, that he had risen as God, the Son. That was, to them, was even worse. That, to them, was the worst possible thing. So they tried to shut him up by killing him. But if news spreads he's alive, 
Nothing can stop him living on. They'll never stop what they call the deception. Because they thought Christ's resurrection was a lie of a delusion. Why? Same reason, the same reason people today never truly consider it a possibility or something. And I think partly behind that, no matter how much evidence is given, and there is some evidence in the Bible and outside, if Jesus is risen, that means I must make him king. Because if Jesus is risen, and all that he's claimed to be is true, he's God in human flesh, he is the creator of me and you, if he's Lord of all, then he rightly demands an accounting for the lives of those he's created. His words of life and hope are true. His condemnation of the religious leaders is true. And they don't want that. And if he's creator, he has authority to point out the car crash that is the life lived with me at the centre, or the life lived as if the creator doesn't exist. But if he does exist, everything changes. And that's great news for those who realise that and follow that, but bad news for those who don't. Because his creatures now have a choice, if this is true, that they either make him Lord or they continue to make themselves Lord. And to the human without the Spirit of God, without God opening our eyes, without just coming to seek him, and, and at least give this the benefit of the doubt and just try and discover the truth of the resurrection. But if we don't give it a chance, it may well be because deep down it's unthinkable for you to give up the, the king of your own mind. I was once there. Uh, I fought and fought and fought. Uh, one thing, I was happy to have my sins forgiven and all that went with it. I was not happy to have someone take over my life. And this is what the Pharisees were not prepared to do. Jesus says this, which is over right there, in a parable of the ten miners, where there was a king and his subjects. And then he says, but his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. That's why these leaders tried anything to dodge the truth of the resurrection. They hated him when he was alive, they hated him when he was dead, and they will hate him when he was raised. That doesn't mean that can't change. And amazingly, later on in Acts, we see that a number of these people, I don't mean these exact people, but of that camp, did turn around and get saved and follow the Lord. So that's not the end of the story. But currently to them, he is a threat to the kingship of their own lives, and their position, and their power, and their pride. You know what? In some senses, the human heart has to change one bit in the last 2,000 years. Dodging the resurrection started on Resurrection Sunday and has been kept alive and well ever since. You go on the internet and we talk to people today about the resurrection, you'll see what we're talking about. And the other interesting thing is that the guards, probably Roman guards, outside the tomb, on the day of the resurrection, see the power of God. They see it with their own eyes, but they deny it. 28 verse 1, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. Oh, I love that. Let's pause for a second. This straightaway dispels the theory that angels are little babies, you think. They're very, very powerful. You don't want to mess with them. Put it that way. He, he rolls back the stone and sits. He takes a two ton sealed stone, breaks the seal, which was cemented in, flips it upwards off the groove and sits on it. <laughs> I would love to have seen that. 
Now, of course, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Just to entertain the fact that there may be a supernatural being does mean that he will do supernatural things. And nothing for these angels will stand in the way of the risen king and they are sent to open the way for him. And this is the kind of power that our God has. And he makes it look so easy. Look at the power of this angel. And this isn't God, this is just one of his angels. 28 verse 3, his appearance was like lightning and his clothes were as white as the snow. The gods were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. So the gods saw the angel who moved the stone and basically thought, it's time to die. We're done. And they've been utterly terrified and scared out of their wits. And they're, they're probably shaking for a, for a long time. And they knew somehow that they were on the wrong side of the angels. But they still later denied the truth and took a bribe from the Jews. Why? Because if they told Pilate that story, he may not believe them and execute them. Now, I think Pilate may well have believed after what he'd been through with Jesus. But why would you be more afraid of Pilate than this angel of God? They knew, they thought that was the end for them. And then they're afraid of puny Pilate. Jesus says this, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that could do no more. But I will show you who you should fear, if you're the wrong side of God. Fear him who, after killing of the body, has power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. So here comes the first resurrection dodge. Dodging the truth of it. And that was the plan all that right at the beginning. The disciples, before resurrection, while he was at the tomb, here's the first resurrection dodge. Dodge, that the disciples stole the body and then claimed them. 28 verse 11. Some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened, seeing the angel and everything. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. You see how these leaders are not the slightest bit interested in the fact that Jesus may well have been. They're just not going to go there. I wonder if you're somebody that would, I see it a lot uh, with some people I talk to, you're one that will get make an informed choice about everything. So you will research everything about something before you invest in it, before you trust it. And when you've got all that information to make an informed choice, why is it that when it comes to Jesus, that we look at all the other possibilities but not that one? That's not the informed choice. And here's pagan, unbelieving soldiers, maybe some of those who crucified Jesus and were in the same fall, would follow three things. They certified his death. They had nothing to gain by lying. They'd seen an angel flip back the stone and sit on it. They almost died with terror. Wouldn't that make you want, begin to wonder whether Jesus truly had been raised? But they didn't. Anything but to acknowledge what they'd seen with their own eyes. They were more worried about puny pilots than Almighty God. And like Judas, who we looked at the other way, they sell off Jesus for cash. And the leader said, if Pilate asks questions, we'll back you up. Verse 14, if this report gets to the government, we will satisfy you and keep you out of trouble. 
So the soldiers took the money, did what they were instructed, and this story has been wildly circulated among the Jews to this very day. It's so funny that some people just don't believe the Bible at all, and yet they're using this very argument to tell people that the resurrection is true. You go, I'll tell you, I wouldn't recommend it on the internet and argue with people, but at the end of the day, this is out there. This is actually out there. And it started, its origin was in the Bible, and we don't believe the Bible. I mean, give me a break. Anyway, but here we see the genius of God. The Jews, Jewish leaders thought they were stopping the truth of the resurrection. But the measures they took in stopping the truth actually made the truth more believable. Let me say why. The tomb was cut out of the rock, so there was no back door. There was one in, entrance in, one entrance out. They then posted the group of Roman guards at the entrance day and night. They sealed the stone in place, making it immovable by human force. The stone weighed up to two tons. It made it impossible for anyone to break into that tomb. What's more believable? That the disciples managed to get past the guards and silently shift the two-ton stone, cemented it on, in on a dome, downward groove, and then bang about in the tomb, get Jesus' dead body and haul it out of the hole. There were many guards posted. If they were asleep, the noise of the stone would have woken at least some of them, if not all. It was a huge stone. What's more likely then? The disciples stealing the body, or the one whom the Jews had seen and heard raise other people from the dead, now having power to move the stone and raise himself from the dead. Both are utterly impossible. But the miracle man, out of those two alternatives, is the safest bet, even logically. They knew what Jesus was capable of. Many saw him at work, and the leaders heard what the soldiers said. Let me ask you what you believe here this morning. Do you believe the lie of these Jewish leaders, or the truth of the resurrection? Here's another thing. Why would all the disciples except John, who was still tortured and exiled, be, be die violent death when they knew they'd stolen the dead body of Jesus. Would you? Would you give up your life when you knew you trusted in the faith that you were part of the cover-up? Would you dodge the truth or would you embrace it? Well, that's the first resurrection of God. It was only one more. Second re resurrection of God. This is something that came a bit later. Jesus never actually died, and then he regained consciousness in the tomb. He then moved the stone from the inside, broke the seal, holding it in place, and pushed the two-ton stone up the groove. On the inside, there is nothing to grip. It's impossible to grip anything. So he can't get hold of it until it's been pushed up a little. Moving the stone from inside is impossible for a healthy man. It's nothing to grip hold of. But Jesus had been whipped by the Romans until the flesh was hanging off his back and so there are records of people's organs being exposed because it literally tears everything off your back. And many died at that flogging and never made it to the cross. He's had that done to him. Then he's had nails in his hands and feet. Then he's been hung up in the hot sun for six hours and he's lost huge amounts of blood and water. And the Romans, if you remember, were going to break his legs to speed up his death. But they didn't because they found he was already dead. Now, but just to make sure, because Romans are expert killers and they loved it at the time, they thrust a spear in his side and blood and water flows out. They made sure... Jesus was stone cold dead, dead when Pilate released that body. There is no other way. You can't escape execution by the Roman. And even if, supposing it was true that he was alive in the tomb, he'd never have the strength to move the stone himself. 
and it's impossible to do it from the inside. Yet this lie again, and you'd see it today, still being circulated now. Now why am I bringing all this up? Let me say that. Can you actually see what's happening to me? People often accept the craziest of explanations, any explanation, but that Jesus was who he said he was. He showed his huge power on earth, and that same power raised him from the dead on the third day. Dawkins and his crew are so hell-bent on denying the Creator that they'd rather believe that aliens created the world, that's what he said, than an all-powerful God. Anything we see, but the option that Jesus exactly who he says he is. That's the issue here. That is the issue. So my friends, let me say this each time, don't be fooled by this. Don't let this world rob you of the joy of the resurrection this Easter. It's happened. It's historically true, in and out of the Bible. It's supernaturally true. And the proof of it is in your brand new life. Because you came alive inside when you, you, when you asked Jesus into your life. That's internal resurrection. And you had a brand new supernatural heart. And you had something that was guaranteeing that internal resurrection, guaranteeing your external resurrection to come. So if you're what we call born again, if you now have new life inside, and your heart has changed, and your desires have changed, that is proof that the whole job hasn't been done yet, and you're going to be resurrected outside soon. Hallelujah. Bible says this, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Unbreakable seal, unlike that too, and I'm sure there's a play on that. Who is the deposit, the Holy Spirit, who brings you to life inside, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. The resurrection is true, friends. Embrace it. And you know, they tried to stop the risen Christ with everything that was in their power. They did not succeed. And one day, if you continue to resist him, try and stop him, you too will shake like those dead men. Nobody wants that, and I don't want that. And I was heading for that. But if you embrace this risen Christ, you will not be afraid, but you will be comforted. Verse 5, the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. That same angel who struck fear into the hearts of those Romans because they opposed Jesus is tender and kind to those who love him and follow him. It's a comfort to those who embrace the risen Christ. Could be you. And if you embrace the risen Christ, you will believe then his word. And it kind of opens up to you. It was black and white before, now it's ultra HD. It's 4K. It's in glorious resolution. Everything starts popping out of you. You'll believe the word and you'll embrace the evidence. Verse 6. He is not here. He has risen. Just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. And if you embrace the risen Christ, you can't wait to tell others. Verse 7. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he's risen from the dead and he's going ahead of you. Because it's exciting. Because it's true. And if you embrace the risen Christ, you can't wait to see him for yourself. Which you will do soon, physically. You can see him by faith, man. but you will soon see him again. Verse 7, there you will see him, now I am told you. And if you embrace the risen Christ, you'll be filled with awe and great joy. You won't miserably sing songs if that's what you do. You won't just be like a... What you call a crash test, don't you? Event ventriloquist, where it's just going like this. Your whole heart will be engaged because it's resurrection day every day. And you'll be filled with awe and great joy. You won't go away saying, I didn't mean that, that's how all right. And you just engage, you'll put your heart into it. 
So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell the disciples. Remember that old song, a lightness in my spirit, a joy that knows no limit, here by the grace of God I stand. That kind of thing. Because resurrection changes everything. It does. And we lose sight of it, friends. There's no need to not rejoice in it. Maybe your heart's become cold as a Christian. Maybe this just doesn't do it for you anymore. You know what? Because you're believing the lie. Again. Is this what Jesus' resurrection means to you? You have hope now. Hope beyond the grave. You have the Spirit who raised Christ from the dead living in you. The same person who raised Christ from the dead is now in you. Do you know it? Do you trust him? His power can smash anything that afflicts you and he will give you the strength to live with it until it's smashed. He will pave the way for your risen being like he did for the, for the way with Jesus. Jesus' resurrection overcame the power of death, the devil, and the world. Now, let me just say this once. Well, I'd like to say it a lot of times. You, Christian, have death defeated, devil destroyed, world beating power running through your veins. Did you know that? Yeah, because sometimes we don't live like that. That's the truth. Let's be reminded. And those who embrace him as Christ see Jesus and cling to him and worship him. Suddenly Jesus met them in verse 9. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet and worshipped him. Is that what you do? You hold on him with a vice-like grip, drop him and let him go. I know he does that with you. I'm talking about you with him. Because this is what happens to your heart when you realise afresh that resurrection is an absolute fact, it is true. And the deposit is in here proving to you that it's true. And it's what resurrection life in Jesus is all about. I read this the other day, it's so good. The body of Jesus was put in a borrowed grave because he wasn't going to need it long. <laughs> so good. He didn't really even warm it up. I couldn't warm it up. But you know what? He wasn't there very long. Friends, take your focus off the edge. You may enjoy them, of course. Take your focus off the edge, the cards. Forget going through the motions on Easter Day. Go to Jesus afresh, embrace Jesus, see Jesus, rejoice in Jesus afresh. Because Good Friday is gone, and Bad Saturday. He's gone. And Resurrection Day is here today and every day. Now you might always feel like it. But each day gets nearer and brighter until that final day. Proverbs 4.18 The path of the righteous, those who are right with God, not for our own goodness. The path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn shining ever brighter. Your life isn't getting darker. It's getting bright until the full light of day. Be encouraged, my friend. Embrace the resurrection. Don't dodge it. Love it. And love him. Who is the resurrection of life. So, start if you'd like to read the